Okay, welcome to the Phobos and Deimos, the Moons of Mars uh, graduate course, and we're very pleased to have with us today Ken Ramsley. Let me say a few words of introduction. My name is Jim Head, and I'm the moderator today. The moderator will, uh, in fact, uh, introduce the speaker, and then we'll integrate the questions as we go along, and we will, um, in fact, uh, we'll lead the discussion. Uh, so I encourage you all to type in questions as we go along, and then also at the end as our discussion evolves. Uh, so first I'd like to introduce the fact that this is a course that is sponsored by the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, and the Institute has a number of teams which are in fact actively engaged uh, in solar system exploration research, and indeed um, this particular class is co-sponsored by the Brown University uh, Survey Evolution Environment of Exploration Destinations, SEED, which is uh, PI is Carly Peters, and also by the University of Central Florida uh, Center for Lunar and Asteroidal Surface Science class, and Dan Britt is the PI there. So we think we've had very successful, at least from our end, uh, several lectures in the course, and today we want to, in fact, um, uh, produce in, uh, one in which we talked about last week, which is the formation and effects of the Stickney impact on Phobos. And our speaker today is Ken Ramsley. Uh, Ken received his master's here at Brown in 2013 and is a, a geoscience researcher and spacecraft systems engineer at Brown. Uh, Ken worked in a number of places previously, particularly at uh, Aero Astro of Ashburn, Virginia, uh, one of the key uh, uh, instrument and spacecraft developers of small spacecraft with Rick, Rick Fleeter was president uh, and Rick is also a uh, professor here at Brown University in the engineering school. Uh, Ken also teaches in the School of Engineering and mentors in topics related to spacecraft systems, electronics, orbital mechanics, and engineering aspects of uh, in fact space radiation environment. And Ken is very instrumental in our efforts in science and engineering synergism which is part of our seed uh, survey uh, activity. So uh, Ken has spent a lot of his time using his engineering talents to look at uh, the Phobos and Deimos environments and also to specifically um, think about uh, the effects, as many of you raised questions about last week, the fate of impact ejected in the deep gravity well uh, of Mars when these two bodies are, in fact, impacted. So with no further ado, <coughs> and with that introduction, let me turn it over to Ken, who will speak to us today on the formation and the infects, effects of the Stickney impact on Phobos. Ken? Thanks, Jim. Indeed, uh, we'll be talking about the Stickney impact on Phobos. Uh, briefly, we'll talk about the effects of ejecta from Mars that intersects Phobos. The talk today is somewhat based on a paper uh, recently submitted, uh, Ramsley and Head, and I won't read the entire title, but uh, the implications of the age of Stickney uh, the Stickney impact on the surface of Phobos is the center of, of the topic today. Uh, you'll see this um, slide from time to time. It's the roadmap that will guide us through the next hour or so. And uh, it's going to start with the general idea of, of what happens to ejecta that leaves Phobos. Um, initially, I'm not going to talk about any one particular impact. I want to talk about uh, just the, the general nature of where does the ejecta go and how is it that most of that comes back to Phobos. Um, after that, we'll, we'll cover the area of the synchronous rotation of, of Phobos and why it is that the Stickney impact uh, very likely broke that, that synchronous, synchronous rotation. Then from there, we'll move on to how long the, the desynchronized rotation of Phobos lasted because that has a lot of implications as to the effects of the, the returning ejecta. And then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll work on, we'll, we'll talk through the accumulation of, of new regolith or excavated material from Phobos that, that is in place on Phobos as new regolith and the processes that, that govern that and how much, how much we would expect to find. And then we'll, we'll from there, we'll plow on down into low velocity ejecta, uh, what happens to the ejecta that, that exits Stickney Crater at, at very low velocities, not, not maybe even leaving the surface of Phobos. And then finally the higher velocity ejecta that comes a little bit later after that. And then we'll, we'll close with one uh, slide where we 
put all the pieces together, all these moving parts, because there are a lot of moving parts here, and try to break it down into the first seconds, minutes, hours, centuries, and millions of years after that, in order to try to piece, piece the picture together of what I'm trying to tell you and what we're talking about today that will include your comments and questions. Um, I want to point out that there's a video uh, and, and these, the slides that you're seeing today are already uh, hosted online if you go to the lecture page today's date and, and the lecture page that supports today's <laughs> lecture uh, you'll, you'll have access to the, a video uh, that, that explains some of this and you'll have access to these slides so if you're interested in, in going back and reviewing these slides they'll, they're already online. Okay, and there's one other thing I'm doing is there will be three sidebars where I, I take a sidestep, sort of like in a textbook you see off to the side, just to explain some concepts that are important uh, to, to our discussion today. So the first one is about synchronous rotation, and you'll be hearing a lot about synchronous rotation. Phobos and Deimos, our own moon, most moons around major planets have synchronous rotation, and, and really what that means is the rotation period is the same as, as the rate of, of the uh, rotation of the main planet that it orbits. So as a consequence, the same face of, of the moon faces the planet. Okay. And, and then in, just in this sidebar, I, I, I want to talk about something called synchronous altitude. And I figure if I put them together in one sidebar and we talk about it all at the, at the same time, we won't perhaps get this confused. Synchronous altitude is is in one example would be the geosynchronous altitude of, of satellites around the Earth that, that orbit over the same spot of the Earth that constantly. Uh, in its most general form, it's defined as the same orbital period. The orbital period of, of the body orbiting the, the main planet is the same as the rotation period of the main planet. Now, the reason I'm raising this here is that there's a, it's a particular uh, property of synchronous altitude, of the synchronous altitude in orbital mechanics. Uh, that's related to tidal forces and the evolution of orbits. If you have a body that's orbiting above the synchronous altitude, it tends to draw uh, angular momentum from the primary planet, and that pushes the, the satellite away so it spirals away. In fact, that's how we decommission uh, ge geosynchronous orbits around the Earth. We just push it into a slightly higher orbit, and we know that this process will gradually spiral these satellites away. Below the synchronous altitude, uh, the orbit decays, and th that's the case with Phobos. It's currently orbiting inside the synchronous altitude. Uh, Deimos is orbiting slightly above the synchronous altitude, and it's slowly spiraling away. And in fact, our own moon is orbiting above the, the Earth's synchronous altitude, and it is also spiraling away. So it's a key concept, because when we talk about what happens to Phobos, you always have to ask the question, well, when did that happen? Was it recent, when, when it has spiraled closer to Mars, or is this more in the past when it was orbiting closer to the synchronous altitude? Now, here's a, um, here's a question from Barbara Cohen. Last week, she, she asked the question, if, you know, if Phobos is in orbit at the time of the Borealis Basin impact, which is this low uh, elevation region of Mars that's, that, we, that some people consider maybe a, a major, huge impact basin from early in the history of Mars. The question is, would debris from that impact uh, rework the surface of Phobos? So that got me thinking about the, the history of the, the orbit of Phobos, and I want to answer this question in sort of a complicated way, and I will answer it, but I want the next slide, next couple of slides are to develop the idea a little bit further. Uh, the synchronous altitude around Mars is around 17 thousand kilometers above the surface of Mars. Um, and one, one of the things when, when we think about the, the, the this, is, this is my pocket Phobos, by the way. Uh, here's Stickney Crater. Uh, you'll see pictures of Stickney Crater. Um, when, when Phobos was orbiting in, in the distant past around Mars, it was orbiting closer to the synchronous altitude. And what this, this chart illustrates is, is, is the decay of the orbit over geological time. So back maybe three billion years ago, it was closer to the synchronous altitude, and in very recent uh, times, it has, it has moved, migrated much closer to Mars, and it's at an accelerating rate. Um, so as a consequence, most of the history of, of Phobos has been far away from Mars, and so if there's ejecta from Mars, from a major impact, um, it's, it's going to be distributed down to a very large volume of space, whereas an impact that's closer to the present day, when Phobos is closer to the Earth, it's going to be exposed to a much greater concentration. And the difference is on the neighborhood of about a factor of 40. So, so as it turns out, um, the, the ejecta that Phobos would accumulate 
in recent uh, geological history is much more concentrated than in the past. Um, some other considerations are, uh, this is from Malash, uh, 1984, uh, where he computes the amount of ejecta that, that exit Mars and reaches escape velocity, which is comparable to the amount of ejecta that reaches the orbits of Phobos and Deimos. No, we're talking about Phobos, but both, really. And it's not very much. It's about 3% of the total impacting body that makes the crater on Phobos. So it's not a lot of ejecta that's sent to higher altitudes. And then when we consider the size of Phobos, I mean, Phobos, this is my pocket Phobos. Um, Mars is, this, you don't know how big the building is I'm in, but I'll tell you that it's, it's a moderately sized building. Mars is the size of the building that we're in. So Phobos is not a very large target. And so as a consequence of both the, the size, well, mainly the orbital history of Phobos and, and the concentration of ejecta that reaches Phobos, uh, the amount of ejecta from Mars is a very small amount, maybe 250 ppm, in, and it's only in the upper regolith of Phobos, where, which has accumulated recently. And that's consistent with Chapaz et al. Uh, 2013, who modeled this process in a completely different way. So, so we have two models that, that strongly suggest that the amount of of ejecta from Mars on the surface of Phobos isn't very isn't very concentrated. Now I, I like to cross check. I'm, I'm an engineer. I like to look at things different ways just to make sure that my ideas are working. So as a cross check, we looked at specific craters just to get a sense for how much ejecta from Mars ends up on Phobos from specific craters on Mars. So we we looked at Tooting Crater, and it's, it's about a 30 kilometer diameter crater. And when we work out how much ejecta winds up on Phobos, a global, a global equivalent layer of deposition is really practically nothing. It's, it's, it's far less than one micron. If we look at Gale Crater, which is, which is we would consider that to be a, one of the, a larger crater, not, not the largest, but we, you know, that, that's a fairly good sized crater on Mars. And the, the deposition of material from that on Phobos is only 13 microns uh, global equivalent on Phobos. So we're, we're looking at a very small amount of ejecta from Mars. Now we'll, let's look at the Hellas Basin and here's, uh, if I can find it, Hell, Hellas Basin which is this geographically low area on, on Mars, a uh, very large impact basin and we worked out the amount of ejecta from Hellas and that's you know maybe five, six millimeters of, of material that ends up on Phobos. It's probably buried deep in, in layers on Phobos, not, not near the surface because it's an ancient event. But then, and, and, and this is what the rest of the talk will be about, is Stickney Crater. Stickney Crater, a nine kilometer diameter crater on Phobos. Um, most of that ejecta comes back to Phobos and Stickney Crater is responsible for a couple of dozen meters of new regolith on the surface of Phobos. So, so one of the things that we begin to understand is that the amount of ejecta that's coming from Mars compared to the amount of ejecta that would be returning from, uh, from an impact on Phobos, the amount of ejecta on Mars is very low. And if you're finding a regolith on the surface of Phobos, almost all of it is coming from impacts on Phobos. Okay, now to answer Barbara's question about the Borealis impact, and I'm sorry to sidestep it a little bit, but it, it's very likely that it was such a huge impact uh, that it produced so much ejecta that ended up in orbit around Mars that it possibly produced the moons of Mars. Uh, I will leave that to uh, Robin Knupp, November 2nd, but, uh, and, but to answer the question, if, Mar if Phobos were in orbit around Mars at the time of the Borealis impact, I would imagine it would be a, a major effect. Maybe as much as Stickney Crater, um, I'm not really sure. It, it, it exceeded the limits of our model. Okay, so let's get back to the roadmap, and I want to talk about just the general properties of what happens to ejecta that leaves Phobos, where does it go? Uh, what happened? And, uh, and I say it re returns to Phobos. Well, how does that happen? And th these are these are frames that are clipped out of our video. And, and the color coding is velocity with respect to Mars. The, this is not an impact. This is just a radial distribution of ejecta that exits from from Phobos in all directions at 800 meters per second. And so, so the first thing we notice is that from the leading hemisphere, we have a higher velocity than the trailing hemisphere. And that's because the ejective velocity adds to the orbital motion of Phobos around Mars on the, on the leading hemisphere. And on the trailing hemisphere, the uh, velocity of the ejecta is subtracted from the orbital velocity of Phobos. And that has some important consequences. Um, the first thing, and so here, here's a, a, a wider view, orbital ejecta, 
from the trailing hemisphere is going to lose angular momentum and from the leading hemisphere it's going to gain angular momentum. And, and the first thing we notice is that uh, the orbital ejecta from the trailing hemisphere that's lost angular momentum uh, loses altitude and the opposite happens from the leading hemisphere. Okay, so we, we have a look at uh, the process as it continues and maybe 10% or so of, of the ejector from the trailing hemisphere intersects Mars and uh, the, the, uh, this continues to orbit Mars. And one of the interesting things that we'll, we'll notice here is, uh, let's see if you can see my cursor, is right at, the, right at the point of the original impact around Mars, all of this ejecta is returning. It's, it's, it's a property of orbital mechanics. You change, one, you change an orbit, it will always return to the point in space where that orbit changed. That, that's something that's true of all orbits. And so all of this ejecta changed its orbit at all at one time, and it all returns. We call it returning to the scene of the crime. Um, so, so here we see it uh, returning to the scene of the crime, and, and it, the process continues. Uh, no matter what the, uh, the orbit uh, from, from the impact is, uh, it heads back to that point in space. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to point out is that when, it, when Phobos encounters this ejecta, some of it's moving through space faster than Phobos, uh, so Phobos is, is intersected from behind, whereas if Phobos overtakes ejecta that's moving more slowly, then Phobos overtakes it. And if in effect what happens is that ejecta that's launched from the trailing hemisphere of Phobos ends up intersecting Phobos on the leading hemisphere and the opposite happens. So as a general principle, secondary impacts on Phobos are in place on the opposite, generally on the opposite side of Phobos. Okay, so, so here, to, here to summarize the, the, the overall picture, um, I've already said that 10% that of the trailing hemisphere uh, ejecta intersects Mars, 40% uh, from leading hemisphere uh, ejecta is sent off to solar system orbits. It, it, it gains enough angular momentum from the leading hemisphere that about 40% of that is lost. And the rest of it that stays in orbit around Mars, over the course of about a million orbits, and this is in the literature, um, re-intersects Phobos and reaccumulates. It accumulates onto the surface of Phobos so in about a thousand years. A small portion of it uh, likely intersects Deimos, and, and if you if you have an impact on Deimos, secondary impact on Deimos from uh, from an impact on Phobos, you start the same process at Phobos, and so there may be some evidence of, of the Stickney impact on Phobos, and that's something that, that uh, Nico was talking about last week. Okay, so to summarize, about 60 to 90 percent of the impact ejector returns to Phobos. Uh, it's focused on the opposite hemisphere from the original impact on Phobos, but now, now we ask an interesting question. That's if, the, 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 if Phobos remains tidally locked, it en ends up on the opposite side. But the question is, what happens if Phobos, if the impact, the Stickney impact in particular, uh, produces a rotation of Phobos? Okay, so now we're on to the second part of our, our roadmap. And uh, the, the question is, how much energy is required to break this, the, uh, the tidal lock of Phobos? Does the impact, the Stickney impact, desynchronize the rotation of Phobos? So once again, this slide that, that illustrates the, the synchronous rotation of Phobos in the present day, where it, its, or, its rotation rate is the same as its orbital rate and, and shows the same face towards Mars. What, what I'm going to show you is, is that, uh, that the Stickney impact breaks that, that relationship. Now here's another view, and uh, it probably is a little bit slow in, 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 on your screen, but Phobos is not in a perfectly circular orbit, so it, it, it gets a little bit ahead, a little behind, it's not directly over the equator, so, so a synchronous uh, orbit it, it, like this wobbles, but it generally stays oriented towards Mars. And here, here is the triaxial ellipsoidal principal axis of, uh, of Phobos, and we see the A axis is the largest axis, and, and, and Phobos uh, rotates on its C axis, the smaller, smaller of its axes. In spacecraft engineering, we call it the gravity gradient effect, and what happens is, is that Phobos and any body, even our own moon, aligns over the longest uh, axis, and, and that's, but because that axis, uh, it doesn't tell you which way is, 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 um, is required, you can, you can actually rotate in one direction or the other direction, and it, it, both 
both are proper um, solutions to the problem. Okay, so the question is how do, how do you break the mo how do you break the, a tidal lock? And there are, there are really two ways. Uh, we we can look at the moment of inertia, which moment of inertia is essentially how is the mass distributed around Phobos or around anybody? And if you change the shape of Phobos, it's it's like an ice skater who's twirling, pulling your arms, and you'll you'll twirl faster. Put out your arms, you'll you'll twirl slower, and it's the same amount of angular momentum is in the in that equation. So Phobos, was, the shape of Phobos was slightly altered by the, the shape uh, by the impact of Stickney Crater. And then there, there are other two, the two other ways that the um, tidal lock can be desynchronized, and that's changing the orbit of Phobos and changing the spin rate of Phobos. Okay. So okay. Sidebar two. Um, this this is this is a slide from last week that, that Nico presented. And this gives us some evidence that perhaps Phobos was indeed uh, desynchronized. The, 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 the original orientation of Phobos may have been rotated 180 degrees to its present orientation. And the evidence comes from what Nico talked about last time, where there's a lot more craters uh, in place on the trailing hemisphere of Phobos compared to the leading hemisphere, whereas the leading hemisphere should have far more uh, exposure to impacts. It orbits. Uh, around Mars and it sweeps up a larger area of, of space and also uh, it, it encounters uh, more impacts because uh, there, it, there's just more opportunities for impacts to take place. So, so the, the, the evidence is that, that very likely that Phobos was reoriented sometime fairly recently uh, in geological time. Okay, so the, um, the, the twirling ice skater effect I already talked about there, there, there are really two interesting ways to, to try to calculate, directly calculate the, the change in the orbital period and the rotational period of Phobos. Uh, for a while, we, we, I was looking at trying to add up all the, the ejecta that comes out of, of Stickney Crater, and I end up using that as, as a cross-check. But um, there's, a, there's a more direct way uh, of calculating acceleration force. If you consider that Stickney Crater is a rocket, and, and that's really one of those strange uh, hybrid ideas that, that maybe uh, only happens when you're an engineer. But, but you, you take the, the, the Stieloskovsky rocket equation and you run it in reverse and you can, you can work out the, the total impulse, especially if you take into consideration the inefficiencies, because a crater obviously is not a, a rocket engine. So here's, here's the equation, and uh, Phobos is the rocket, and the propellant is, is the mass of the projectile that produces Stickney Crater. And the exhaust velocity of, of the rocket is, is the projectile velocity. And, and there's your, that is a way to directly calculate the, the total impulse. Now, of course, um, we, ha we, have, we have to figure out what is the size and what is the mass of these, of these different properties. And we have a fairly good idea of the mass of Phobos. And working from scaling equations for a nine kilometer crater on, on Phobos, uh, averaging a few of those together, we, we come up with about 840 meters for the diameter of the impactor if it takes place on the leading hemisphere of Phobos, and a, a velocity that's for this area of space in the vicinity of Mars. Uh, this is from Ivanov and some of our own work that's a little more than 12 kilometers uh, per second. If the, if the impact took place on the trailing hemisphere of Phobos, it's essentially the same. We just have to have a bigger impactor because the velocity is not as high. Okay, so then the question is, well, how does all of this energy, how is it partitioned? Where does it go? And so the source of the acceleration impulse is the flow of ejecta that leaves the crater. Um, that's where most of it comes from. Some of it comes from the resistance of, 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 the, cra of the impact to forming the crater. There's pressure against Phobos as material is compressed into Phobos. There's a little bit of something from spallation, which is an early uh, shock-driven crater excavation process. There isn't a, it, it's a high-energy process, but there isn't a lot of uh, volume of material involved. And then there's a very high volume uh, vapor that's ejected, but there's very low mass involved. The inefficiencies are where the energy is used to uh, heat and melt and vaporize rock, uh, fracture rock, uh, uh, shock metamorphosized uh, minerals. Uh, then, then, then there's 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 compression effects that don't 
produce a, uh, an acceleration force like the horizontal compression inside the crater and, and some crater uplift, uh, jetting, that, that tends to be horizontal in all directions. There, there's energy being expended, but it's not an impulse that changes anything about Phobos. And then there's the cone shape of ejecta coming out of Phobos that's about a 45 degree angle on average, not a, not a nice rocket nozzle that pushes it out at 90 degrees. Okay, so when we take all of those things into consideration, the, the conversion efficiency uh, compared to a perfect uh, rocket engine uh, system is about 60%. And that works out to a total acceleration impulse on Phobos of a little more than one meter per second. Now, for a long time, I didn't think that that was very much. But it turns out that if you, you work through the equations, uh, it, it has a lot, of, a lot of effects. And one of the first things that it's kind of interesting is, okay, we have a look. If you look at Stickney Crater in, in the lower part of the screen, you'll, you'll notice that it's not uh, perpendicular to the center of gravity of, of Phobos. It's tipped at an angle. And so that produces uh, two vectors. Uh, we have a vector that's through the center of gravity of, of Phobos, and we have a vector that's oriented to the east. And so when we partition that, we realize, OK, the vector that goes through Phobos changes the orbit of Phobos. But that vector to the east is going to directly increase the rotation rate of Phobos. When we work through all the numbers, we realize that, amazingly, 97% of the impulse is directed towards changing the orbit. But in terms of the total effect of, of desynchronizing the tidal lock, it, it's less than 1% because of how much energy is required to change the orbit, whereas not m as much energy at all is required to directly uh, increase the rotation of Phobos. So only 3% of, of the total impulse, but that's responsible for about 90% of the desynchronization. And, and the twirling ice skater effect that I won't go into any more de detail than this, uh, that adds about 10% uh, of the desynchronization effect. Okay, so here's our last sidebar, and, well, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the age of, of the Stickney Crater in, in the neighborhood of uh, about, a mil about 100 million to 500 million years, and so I, it's really need to stop and explain why uh, we're constraining the age in, in that range and, and our modeling in that range. The, and the first thing is, is that whenever you're trying to set a range, you say, well, it, it's, it's probably in a certain time in the past all the way to the present. Well, it turns out, if you look at Phobos, there's space weathering. So it, the Stickney crater probably didn't take place in the recent present, uh, in, in the recent past. It, it probably took place at some point when, when there was enough time for there to be space weathering. So at a bare minimum, we're saying uh, 100 million years as, as the most recent, just because of space weathering. It's pro probably a lot older than that. But that in just, it, rather than just modeling at, at uh, you know, like a thousand years ago, we wanted to push it back a little bit. So that, that that's that's where we're setting our lower bound, and the upper bound is based on the observations of Thomas, who uh, who uh, observed that that there are a lot of boulders in the vicinity of Stickney Crater that are consistent with ejecta from Stickney Crater, and Bozilevsky, 2015, who uh, worked out that the these boulders could only still be present if if Stickney Crater were less than about 500 million years old. Um, otherwise, we have a boulder uh, degradation from, from impacts uh, that, that gradually destroy the boulders over time. And here's, here's an image from the moon that, that illustrates this process of boulder uh, destruction from impacts. So, so we're, we're, we're generally working within those two constraints because space weathering says that it has to be older. Uh, than in the present day, but the boulder evidence suggests that it can't be much more than about a half a billion years. Okay, so th this is this is to summarize the uh, desynchronization of Phobos, and um, the, the the orbit did change. Uh, it changed somewhere in the neighborhood of five to uh, ten kilometers in semi-major axis, which is really less than the diameter of Phobos. The desynchronization, uh, because of that, is, is very, uh, very small due to the orbit, less than 1%. Uh, the change in the moment of inertia, uh, just, just changing the shape of Phobos, that twirling ice skater effect, uh, that's responsible for around 10%. And the, the, the eastward impulse, the, the, this, the lateral vector of, of, stick, of the impulse, because Stickney is tilted, um, produced the, the majority. As a consequence of being closer to uh, Mars in the present day, or near the present day, uh, the amount of energy, um, the Phobos would be rotating faster, so the amount of energy would be less 
um, compared to the rotational energy. Um, oops. Okay, hang on. Okay, uh, my screen just went away. Uh, um, everybody's okay. Okay, so, um, so at any rate, uh, we have we have a, more, a greater effect in the past when Phobos wasn't rotating a, as as rapidly, and as a consequence of that. Uh, but but in in both cases, we, we have around three or uh, every every three orbits around uh, Mars, uh, Phobos is going to rotate, make one extra rotation. Okay. So let's let's move on on the roadmap and and, and we want to look at the the desynchronization or and we've looked at the desynchronization but what about the spin time because one of the questions is if if Phobos despun from that desynchronization in a matter of hours well we'll end up with one orientation or the other uh, but so we really wanted to know how long does it take before Phobos desynchronizes so we have two. Uh, we have three possible outcomes. One is that the tidal lock wasn't broken, and we've already shown that that's not the case. Uh, the second outcome is that the desynchronization is brief, or the third possible outcome is the re uh, the resynchronization despin period of time was very long. So let's look at those. And w one of the things that happens uh, when when we uh, consider the you know, outcome one is is that. Just as I described earlier, you have an impact on one side of Phobos, and all of the secondary impacts will take place on the opposite side. But that outcome is not the case. Okay. Outcome two, um, if, if we have a brief period of uh, desynchronization, it's possible that, that the returning ejecta will either end up on the opposite side or the same side. It will be preferentially one or the other. And then the third outcome is that, that Phobos uh, rotates independent uh, of its uh, orbit of its um, orbital period continues to rotate for a very long time and that uniformly in places a returning ejecta. So okay, so this, this is um, a bit of an eye chart, but th this is the formula that we use to work out despin, and and a lot of this is typically used to try to work out the despin of new objects uh, during the solar system formation and so forth. And, and two of the, the, the factors that we have here, the original initial de, uh, rotation rate and the semi-major axis are usually very poorly understood, but in our model they're very well understood. So we've, we've removed uh, two sources of error in the model. Typically this, this uh, equation uh, of Gladman et al. Is, uh, is considered to be accurate within plus or minus one order of magnitude, but when we remo remove the uncertainty of the, the uh, the spin rate and, and the semi-major axis, uh, it's down to about plus or minus a factor of two, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, we still don't know Q, which is the uh, Q and K2, which are related to the properties uh, of, the, of the moon, of the body that's despinning, uh, that dissipate energy. But, but there, you know, there's, there are bounded, there are assumptions that we can make that, that, uh, that constrain that within reason. So when we work through this formula, uh, it turns out that at, at an impact of around uh, 100 million years ago, uh, 0.1 billion years, uh, we, it, it, it calculates to about 20,000 years, uh, and, and when we apply our error bar, it's at least 5,000 years. It's at least 5,000 years. And at a higher altitude, uh, at about uh, half a billion years, uh, it's nominally around 60,000 uh, years to despin and around 14,000 years if we apply our error bar. So it looks like outcome three is the correct outcome. Um, that Phobos continues to rotate well past the amount of time that's required for uh, the ejecta return to, to return to Phobos and that ejecta is therefore uniformly uh, applied to the surface of Phobos. Okay, so let, let's continue on down uh, on the road map. And the question we have is, is okay, wait, we, we understand that, that the ejecta accumulates uh, from the Stickney impact, but uh, we, you know, we're going to have some sense for, for how much is that? How much ejecta is produced? What's the nature of that? And so in order to get at that, here, here's some questions. You know, the first is, it was, what's the volume and mass of Stickney ejecta that's inserted into orbits around Mars? Uh, or so even a lower velocity component that, that doesn't even leave the surface of Phobos. How much, how much ejecta are we talking about? 
And then the question is, um, we're, we're also thinking about secondary impacts because we have secondary impacts that return to Phobos at fairly high velocities. They're going to dig up more of the surface of Phobos. They're going to produce more ejecta that goes into orbit around Mars. And so we see that there's a secondary process where, se where these, these impacts uh, are, are excavating additional material. So in, in essence, we're, we're thinking, okay, well, we have ejecta that's accumulated uh, from the Stickney impact, but then we have ejecta that's accumulated from the secondary impacts. And so how much, eje how much additional ejecta was, was produced by the secondary impacts? And then overall, just what's the global equivalent thickness of, a, of ejecta? And I've already told you what that is, but I want to walk you through the process. Okay, so the, the, uh, we consider Stickney Crater, as Nico pointed out last week, to be a simple crater. Uh, depth uh, diameter ratio of around a factor of five. So uh, the total crater volume is, is roughly around 80 uh, cubic kilometers. Now, the way craters work is, is that not all of that volume is ejected out of the crater. About half of it is compressed into the target body. So we're working with about half of that, that volume being uh, ejected out of Stickney Crater and available. Uh, some of that is lost to solar orbit. Some of that is lost to the surface of Mars. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not all of the ejecta, it, it, but it's a large portion of the ejecta <coughs> winds up back on the surface of, of Phobos. Now, from a leading hemisphere impact, we lose more than from a trailing hemisphere impact. And, and so, as you see here, we have a total volume of around 23 cubic kilometers from a leading hemisphere and around 35 from a, trail, from a trailing hemisphere impact. And when we work that out over the total areas, the surface area of Phobos, that's a total average global accumulation of somewhere between 15 or 20 uh, meters thick of, of new material that's excavated from the Stickney impact that winds up back on Phobos. Uh, Thomas et al. 2002 suggests that uh, because lower, very low velocity ejecta may wind up not leaving uh, Phobos entirely, uh, that there may be a preferential uh, accumulation, a greater thickness closer approximately to uh, the Stickney impact. Okay, this is definitely an eye chart, but, but I, what I want to tell you is that, that we work through the process, the size frequency distribution of ejecta that leaves Phobos, and we, we work that out according to the size that's, that's required in order to, ha to produce a, a reasonable uh, uh, linear distribution of ejecta in terms of the size of the blocks and the, the returning impactors. Um, and ba based on the, the, the size of the blocks and the velocities that we're expecting for return, for return uh, from orbit around Mars and the numbers of these, we're able to work out a, a distrib size frequency distribution of secondary impacts. Okay, so th th these numbers are almost identical. Kind of, I, mean, I almost thought I, I repeated the last chart, but when we consider the amount of ejecta that's produced from sex, uh, secondary impacts, uh, some of these are, need to dig down through the accumulating ejecta that's already returning from this from the earlier uh, Stickney impact ejecta. So it, we we reduce it. We, we keep we only consider the largest impacts, and we consider that only about half of that ejecta is new impact ejecta. So we get almost the same amount of ejecta returning from secondary impacts as the original uh, sticking impact. And we add the two together, um, we, there's a lot of ejecta. There's a lot of ejecta, m multiple uh, dozens of meters of, of new ejecta that's emplaced and gardened into the surface of Phobos as a consequence of the sticking impact when we combine the sticking impact with the secondary ejecta. Okay, so well, let's, let's push on to uh, step three on our on, on step five on our uh, roadmap, and, and the question is: Are right, we can, we sort of calculated all of this, and, and and you can imagine, okay, there's a lot coming back. Well, what happens? What what is the process? What are the steps here? You know, if you happen to be living on Phobos and you have a force field to protect yourself, or, and you look out your window and you say, you know, what are you going to see when, when all of this ejecta is returning to, to Phobos? What are the effects? So, okay, well, one of the things I was, I was really interested in is low velocity ejecta. And the, 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 the um, and, and, well, well, first of all, it's actually, it turns out that I was thinking about cross-checking 
the process, as I talked about earlier, J just by considering the velocity of ejecta as as the, as the impulse, the source of impulse to desynchronize the rotation of Phobos. And so I, I went back through that, and and when I, when I averaged out the the amount of ejecta according to a very linear model where we start with the peak velocity of ejecta and plot that down to zero and draw a straight line. It turns out that the average of that is much too high. There's, there's too much um, energy in that kind of a system. And so when, when you look at it, you say, well, there's only really one solution, and that is that, that, the, that the mass of ejecta uh, must be concentrated at, at uh, lower velocities. Um, so when we consider that, uh, we, we have uh, an average velocity of returning ejecta that's much lower uh, than, than the uh, ejecta that, that uh, okay. it's, much, it's just much lower. I'll, we'll stop there. Okay, so the question is, okay, what happens to this low velocity ejecta? And you partition ejecta from craters into two general categories. There's the ejecta, higher velocity ejecta that returns to the, the planet and produces secondary impacts. And there's lower velocity ejecta that produces continuous deposits. Now, on Phobos, there's so little gravity that most of that also goes out into orbit around Mars. But when that returns, still, it's going to return in a way that doesn't produce secondary impacts. So to, to work that out, there we, uh, we studied the, the work of, of McKetchen et al. Um, back in 1973, and, and where, where he and his group modeled the amount of ejecta from craters, um, the, this continuous ejecta from craters that doesn't produce secondary impacts. And I assume, and it's an assumption, that uh, Phobos, the Phobos impact produces the same proportion. It doesn't just end up next to the crater. It ends up everywhere. It comes back to Phobos everywhere. But that tells us generally what the proportion of, of secondary, uh, of the lower velocity impact a lower velocity material is that doesn't produce craters. So uh, Wilson and Head 2014 describes uh, the fate of this lower velocity. Some of it um, leaves Phobos, some of it bounces along the surface, uh, some of the largest blocks uh, will, will roll right out of the crater. Now we're talking about very low uh, velocities. Um, here, here's a, a model of velocity of ejecta that exits uh, Stickney Crater at 5 to 8 meters per second, which is right around the edge of, of this escape velocity, depending upon which direction you're going in. Uh, you, will, you will either reach escape velocity or you will return to Phobos. And so this takes into account the rotation of Phobos, the orbital period of Phobos, the gravity of Phobos, uh, the gravity of Mars, all of these factors. And, we, and, and, and after 10 minutes, you know, it, it was a radial distribution. But then all of these factors begin to take hold. And what you see is a, is a preferential distribution of ejecta that, that, that washes, that, that, that runs off to the east as a consequence of all of these factors. OK, so one of the things, one of the early things that will happen soon after the Stickney crater within about an hour or so is that you have this material returning to Stickney crater preferentially west to east. And when you look at Stickney crater, you, you see this, 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 this preferential uh, uh, distribution of, of grooves and so forth uh, heading in that direction that the blue material is washing in that direction. You don't see as much in the other direction. And so uh, this is more of a hypothesis, but, but we, we hypothesize that the material that, that washes through and, and works, works its way through the crater west to east excavates impact melt and loose material from, from the floor of the crater and, and spreads it out over the east rim. And when we look at up close at, at a closer crater, at an 800 meter diameter crater on the rim of Stickney, we also see that the same preferential distribution of ejecta that, that's heading from west to east. So that suggests that, that, that there's low velocity material that, that's interacting with the, with the crater soon after the impact. Here's a figure from Malash, uh, 1989, where he's showing the, the position of ejecta blocks sitting on the rim of Meteor Crater in Arizona. And from Wilson and Head, uh, the, 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 notionally, you have a, a distribution of blocks uh, with gradually lower and lower velocities and larger and larger sizes. 
And eventually, uh, you're going to get to the point where these blocks are just going to barely roll out onto the, the rim of the crater. Now, on Phobos, uh, you don't have gr a lot of gravity. You have very low gravity. And what's keeping these crater, these blocks um, from uh, continuing on is the gravity of the Earth. But on Phobos, they will continue on. And here's a objective from um, a crater on the moon to, to, to show you uh, an image of what some of these blocks look like from a fresh impact on the moon where they've been mobilized out of the crater but haven't haven't uh, gone very far because of low velocity. So I'm really interested in the very lowest velocity, less than five meters per second, which is the sort of velocity that will tend to stay on the surface of Phobos. So we take this 23 percent of, of continuous deposit ejecta and, it, and that's the lowest velocity ejecta that's coming out of Stickney Crater. It's, it's lower than, than the average of, of in the neighborhood of maybe a couple of hundred meters per second, maybe less than 100 meters per second. And so this is, once again, this is, this is a hypothesis that we're working on. If, if you take just 10 percent of this continuous ejecta that tends to be preferentially larger boulders, lower velocity boulders, just 10 percent of that, that's enough to account for all of the grooves that we see on Phobos, assuming that these boulders roll out of the crater and continue to roll under the low gravity conditions of Phobos. There's really not much to stop them. Uh, the gravity of, of Mars is pushing them along. Uh, if Phobos weren't there, uh, they, would, they would already be in orbit. So th it's a very complicated gravitational model, but it, there's enough ejected to account for it. There's definitely enough ejected to, to account for it. It's only 2% of all of the ejecta from Stickney Crater. Okay, and, and John Murray will be talking next week in great detail about the, about the grooves, describing them and so forth. And just here are some, some um, statistics about the grooves. There's several hundred. Uh, they're generally parallel. They're generally in, in the neighborhood of uh, 800 to 400 meters wide. They don't, we don't see many. We don't see any really less than about eight, 80 uh, meters wide. Uh, they're very long. A lot, a lot of them are up to 20 or 30 kilometers long. Uh, and as Nico pointed out, uh, they appear to be about the same age as Stickney Crater, which it tends to get get us thinking that that Stickney Crater is a reasonable source for this group for the crews. Okay, and here's here's uh, what you probably are seeing as a bit of a choppy animation. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of the distribution of the grooves on Phobos, uh, if you download the, the PowerPoint slide from our website, you'll get a nice smooth view of this. But uh, they, the grooves uh, are fairly widely dispersed uh, across the surface of Phobos. There's, there's an area on the uh, trailing hemisphere of Phobos that, that appears to be devoid of grooves. Uh, and there, there may be some good reasons for that that I will defer to John and perhaps discuss at some point in the future. Okay, so, so here's a question that, that's often raised, is if you have large boulders on the surface of Phobos that are producing <coughs> grooves, or just you say there should be, even if they don't produce grooves, we, we, we very clearly would, we would expect there should be boulders from uh, the impact on Stickney. And, and we do see the smaller boulders uh, and maybe a few big ones, but, but not, not the, the number that would be responsible for the grooves. And so what happened to them? And if you imagine the, that we have secondary impacts returning uh, from orbit around uh, Phobos that, that have a huge uh, spike of, of in, incoming flux, that it's very possible that there's enough impact uh, ejecta that's breaking up these large boulders into smaller boulders. It's a hypothesis. Okay, so we're on to um, road number six, roadmap number six, and the, the, now, now the question is, okay, I talked about high velocity impact ejecta. What does that look like? What does that look like? And, and here we are, here's Phobos uh, intersecting ejecta that's in orbit around Mars. And how it works out is it's, you, as, as we discussed, because Phobos, it, the rotation of Phobos is desynchronized, it's continuing to rotate during this process, um, the, it's uniformly, these, re, these returning secondary impacts are uniformly distributed across the surface of Phobos. It's episodic. It only happens once every orbit when Phobos orbits through that one point of focus. The rest of the time, there, there's, 
essentially no, no intersections at all. Uh, because of the cone-shaped distribution of the original ejecta, the secondary impacts uh, uh, intersect about 70% of the surface of Phobos. And the secondary impacts, as I was saying, they excavate and relaunch material into orbit. Now the process continues, energy is dissipated, eventually the velocities are lower, and the material accumulates onto the surface of Phobos. And over time, the intensity of these impacts uh, is reduced and is spread out along the surface of Phobos. Now, one of the interesting things is that early on in the process, the focus is really tight. You have the, the time that's required to produce the crater and the time that's required for Phobos to travel through that period, of that location in space. So early on, in the first few years after the sticking impact, we're seeing huge spikes of returning ejecta, but only 18 seconds. So all of a sudden, you're in your in your bunker on uh, behind your force field on Phobos, and you look out and you see this storm of, of uh, looks like a hailstorm, except off in the distance you're seeing things exploding and flashes of light, and and then it's over, and it's like once in orbit. Gradually over time, it, it diminishes and spreads out. Um, another. I chart, and uh, for those who are familiar with uh, size frequency distributions, uh, this works out the distribution of the secondary impacts on Phobos. And the red, the red bar is the first 10 years, the, the green, the green uh, plots are the next 100 years, and then the, the blue is the, the, the last 900 or 1,000 years, something like that. And the, the <coughs> idea is that, that the impact flux is stronger and more intense in the beginning and it wanes over time. Now, to break this out into something that, that makes a little more sense, uh, what I did is, is, I, is I binned some of these, uh, I binned some of the larger impacts uh, into a range of sizes. So, so on each encounter early in the history of, of Phobos, uh, this would be a trailing hemisphere impact, this would be the more in, intense of the, the, the impacts. Uh, each 18 second window, every square kilometer of, of Phobos, or in, within that 70% that, that area that's exposed, every square kilometer is going to see uh, around four craters that are two to four meters in diameter. And, and you, can, you can read this for yourself. Uh, that's a fair number of impacts every uh, seven or eight or ten hours, something like that. And if you crawl out of your, your fortified uh, Phobos uh, force field enclosed uh, Bunker and have a look after a year. Uh, within a, a, a you know, within every square kilometer of Phobos, you're going to see uh, an impact four impact craters, you know, 50 to 100 meters in diameter. Just huge. It, it would be like a war zone. It would be unbelievable the amount of the number of craters that you would find. Okay. Then we, then we look at the entire thousand years that that's required. The, the one million orbital intersections, more or less, that are required to return all of the ejecta. And we're looking at an even more astonishing uh, uh, idea that, that every square kilometer of Phobos is exposed to two craters between you know, 500 and 1,000 meters in diameter. It, uh, it's, it, it's an amazing thing. Um, so, so, okay, so we, we'll, look on, we'll look at the entire surface of Phobos. And the entire surface of Phobos receives uh, you know, 40 craters uh, larger than uh, one and a half kilometers in diameter, and once again, you, you can read this for yourself. Uh, they, they don't land you know, uniformly, they land partly on top of each other, and there's, there's a, a whole science of saturation as to how, what, what's the size beyond which um, or below which that, that any new crater will simply d destroy a crater of its own size. And it works out with this size frequency distribution that it's around 60 to 80 meters uh, in terms of crater sizes that are likely to reach this point of saturation. And that, that is kind of interesting because that's also about the, the minimum size of the width of grooves that we see on Phobos. And with, so if you have a saturation of around 80 meter diameter craters, um, we wouldn't expect to see any grooves that are smaller than 80 meters. Okay, so coming down the home stretch on this, um, Applying this a little bit more, here's from last week. This is Nico's slides uh, on, on slide on, or on the on the left from last week. And what I do is is I combine his size frequency distribution, which is the red chart, uh, the red uh, diamonds, 
and, and I overlay the size frequency distribution of the ejecta that's produced and secondary impacts from Phobos. So this is from a trailing hemisphere impact. Uh, the next slide is from a leading hemisphere impact. But it turns out that we see a kink in the size frequency distribution of impacts uh, to the west of Stickney Crater. Um, and and that's, it's, it's which suggests that we have a superposition, a new event, strong impact of secondary impacts on Phobos. And it's consistent with the secondary impacts that we predict from the Stickney impact. So it's, it's, there's a very strong s suggestion here that that, that kink wasn't produced by the secondary. Available for that, but it's, it's uh, comparable to, to the uh, kink that we're seeing there. Now, when we look inside Stickney Crater, there is no kink. All we see are the size frequency distribution that's consistent with secondary impacts. So here we have, and this is the trailing hemisphere impact and leading hemisphere impact. There's almost enough ejected to account for that. So, so we're seeing, you know, that most of the craters inside the floor of Stickney Crater are actually secondary impacts from Stickney Crater, and that's because Phobos is continuing to rotate. It's continuing to be desynchronized during this return of ejecta. So unfortunately, what this means is that we can't do, we can't use crater counting to establish the age of Stickney Crater. Uh, we're, we're stuck because any, anything that's smaller than about 600 meters in diameter, uh, in diameter, in terms of crater diameters, is most likely secondary impacts from Stickney Crater. So here we are back with uh, our age uh, dilemma. And so we're, we're, once again, we're constrained uh, by space weathering, uh, which is probably significantly more than 100 million years. And we're constrained by the boulder evidence, the survival of boulders on Phobos, which limits us to maybe a half a billion years. So that's what we're working with for the age of, of Stickney Crater. OK, so our, the, last, the last, really, it's one slide. Um, that, that, that puts all of these pieces together. And, you know, there's a lot of moving parts here. The, you know, the, the, we have things that are happening early on. We have things that are happening later. We have a lot of reworking. And so what, what I want to do is just put this on a timeline to, to give you a sense uh, for what the process was. And so it, just in the, in, in the few seconds and minutes and hours that followed the Stickney impact, you, you have the immediate desynchronization of Phobos from the impact. That happens almost immediately, within seconds. Uh, the, the, lowest, the low velocity ejecta is the first thing that leaves the crater. Uh, it, it, we, it will roll, some of it will, will uh, leave the crater and, and return and scour through the crater. That, that's over a course of up to an hour or so. But the very lowest velocity ejecta is, is within a, a minute or two after the impact is already beginning to roll over the crater rim and is beginning to uh, roll across the surface of Phobos. Okay, in the next thousand years, we have uh, this high velocity of ejecta and, and lower velocity ejecta returning to, to Phobos, creating secondary impacts, producing more ejecta. And that process gradually winding down, according to the literature. And after roughly a million orbits of Phobos and a thousand years, uh, with that accumulates um, back onto Phobos. So during this time, we're, we're excavating material, uh, which is fragmenting perhaps well, more very likely fragmenting and breaking up larger boulders that are on the surface of Phobos, uh, destroying any grooves that are narrower than 80 meters or smaller um, sorts of, of grooves because of the saturation of the impacts, and adding a, a new layer of accumulated ejecta that's excavated from depth. Uh, some of it's older regolith. Some of it, some of it is is material from even deeper than. Uh, the regolith that was on the surface of Phobos prior to these impacts. And then after at least 5,000 years and more likely 20,000 years, Phobos finally relocks into a tidal lock, into its probably its present day tidal lock. Uh, whether it started off in this same tidal lock or it started off oriented uh, 180 degrees, uh, the evidence suggests that it, it was oriented at 180 degrees and, and has now relocked to its present orientation. But that took place long after all of this material reaccumulated onto the surface of Phobos. Uh, 
And then over the, the next several hundred years, a million years, right to the present, uh, we have continuing background impacts, we have boulder degradation, we have space weathering, and we have you know, the, the very gentle, comparatively gentle processes uh, that, that continue to modify and uh, rework the surface of Phobos. So with that, uh, I will uh, be interested in taking your comments and questions, and Jim, Jim Head will handle the moderation of that. Um, I don't know about moderation, but I'll certainly uh, be. This, let's, uh, this has really been interesting. The questions are absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I think it might be simpler if we started from the back, from the end, and work backwards, uh, because I think that's mostly what's on people's mind, and then we'll go back to the beginning, if you will. Okay. So um, there were a number of questions about the grooves, and again, John Murray will be talking uh, next week about the origin of the grooves, um, a, a, bunch, a variety of different theories. Uh, so, so we will come back to that for sure, and we'll come back to it, I'm sure, after John's talk too, because it's a very uh, enigmatic uh, problem with uh, with lots of different possibilities. So, uh, a couple of people asked questions, uh, uh, UCF 445 and, and Stephanie Gibson. Um, about the friction of the loose regolith. So uh, basically, Stephanie was saying that the regolith, the boulders are plowing into the regolith. How can they uh, be plowing into the regolith and still uh, essentially go such great distances? And the question is, um, uh, is um, yeah, so uh, essentially that's a similar question um, to uh, about why you know, what, what is the effect of the soil on the grooves? And so, you know, is there any uh, contradiction? I mean, should these boulders, when they start rolling on the regolith, come to an immediate stop? Or what might uh, be consistent with their long links in a, in a rolling uh, ejecta uh, scenario? Um, well, the first, first thing to consider is that the gravity on Phobos is 300 times less than the, than the moon and about a thousand times less than Earth. So the, the idea of plowing into the ground is probably not what we're seeing. What, what we're seeing, and, and, and I'm hypothesizing, I'm, I, there's more work to be done, but uh, the, the, pap uh, the, the paper Wilson and Head explores this in some detail. Uh, the, the idea is that you have a, a, a block that weigh, that's maybe, maybe weighs a million metric tons. So Okay, so yeah, it may be on the one hand it should be plowing in, and maybe on the other hand, uh, because there's not so much gravity, it isn't plowing in. But but, but what notionally what, what what's considered is that it's not really plowing. Is is that the, as it as it as it goes along the surface, the mass is just compressing the loose regolith because because Phobos has a fairly low uh, density, and we would assume that that the the this, the regolith near the upper near the surface of Phobos is even a lower density with lots of pore spaces. And so just the sheer mass of, of, the, of the, the block rolling across the surface might be enough to produce an indentation of the grooves. And we, we say they're grooves, but, but when we consider the, the depth to diameter ratio, it's not very much. It's like, I know off the top of my head, maybe a factor of 1 to 10 or something like that. So you can, pr you can print onto the surface, the, the shape of the grooves, without having to, to, to plow like a farm plow in order to dig them up. You really don't have to dig them up. Uh, it, it is a good question. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, you have to trade the amount of energy and you have to work out how much energy is being depleted as, as the boulder is working its way across the surface. So you have to, have to also understand that Mars is adding energy to the process all along. You have gravitational energy that's being added to the system. Okay, so just, just to add a little commentary to that too, I think uh, if you look at the Wilson and Head or uh, paper, that you, you'll also see we address that issue and, uh, and there's a lot of images in there of lunar boulder tracks which are quite informative in terms of some of the questions that are being addressed. Basically, many of the boulders are rounded in nature. They're not, um, they're not so much plowing as they are rolling and so if you think about the radius of curvature there, they're not actually, they're only a small part of the boulder itself is actually uh, touching the ground per se, and the boulder is going to be, in many cases, wider than the boulder tracks. So, um, so the combination of things that Ken talked about plus, plus that factor uh, can have a big effect uh, as well. And the lunar boulder tracks that, that many of us have looked at really provide some informative um, uh, comparisons in terms of a, a number of the questions that, that are addressed. So, 
uh, let me point out uh, a combination of things on grooves. Uh, West Chambers asked about the fact that the grooves uh, look uniform in width and depth. Is this consistent with the rolling boulder? Uh, I think from the lunar lunar tracks that is often the case. And Anton Ermakov asked about the ends of the grooves. What's going on at the ends of the grooves? And Richard uh, Jarosek talked about the question of uh, shouldn't even low velocity boulders actually be Phobos since it's inside the Roche limit? So you want to say a few words about those? Uh, um, yeah, well, I'm, I'll go in reverse. Uh, Definitely, Phobos is within the Roche limit. Um, at uh, 500 million years in the past, uh, it wasn't as close to Mars, and so the the uh, the, the tendency of, of boulders rolling on the surface to leave Phobos is is far less. Uh, it, it's a very tenuous sort of thing. Um, indeed, they want to leave uh, Phobos, uh, but because uh, Phobos is rotating, because uh, the uh, block may be on the opposite side of the orbit that the block wants to uh, take off into. It may remain on the surface even though it wants to be in orbit. So it's, it's a very complicated uh, set of circumstances. It, it, I, according to my own preliminary models, uh, I do see boulders leaving and I also see them um, returning. So uh, that's really the subject of, of some additional uh, research. But, but the further back in time that you go, the, the more likely it is that boulders are able to stay on the surface. So another question was uh, that Bob uh, Marcialis asked uh, whether or not uh, we should see, in fact, if these things are bouncing, shouldn't we see some sort of effects from that? And I think to first order, many of the grooves are beaded in nature, which when we look at the lunar ones is, is really consistent with um, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of thing, the bouncing you're talking about. In fact, we see on the moon lots of evidence for spacing between grooves, depending on what the slope is and um, what the what the uh, uh, you know the the slope and kind of the terracing that goes on. You can see them convert from bouncing, uh, where the pits are separated, to to essentially beaded uh, to very linear rolling when it's uh, when it's beginning to come to a halt. So that that's something to look into as well. But the question was. Um, if infalling ejecta, from Bob Marcialis too, if infalling ejecta is degrading the boulders, why doesn't it great, degrade the grooves too? It does. It does. In fact, if you look at the grooves and uh, Murchie, I'm not sure what year Murchie et al. Um, characterizes the grooves, and, and it turns out that the smaller, narrower grooves are more heavily degraded than the larger grooves. So, yeah, you, you, it, it, you're right. It is degrading the grooves, and when you reach the point where you you're at saturation, you don't see any grooves at all. And a couple of other groove questions. Anton uh, asked, uh, when, when, when the grooves go across craters, uh, do they show any, basically, do they show any deflection? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, if you look at, at photographs uh, of, of uh, the, the groove tracks, we'll just call them groove tracks, uh, there is very little deflection. And that's really, it's indica it, it indicates the, potentially, the, uh, the nature of the fact that Phobos does have gravity, and these these boulders are moving very slowly, you know, two to three meters per second. It's 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 like, you know, I sometimes describe it. If you were to watch it, it would be like the progression of the Walking Dead. I mean, you can barely tell that they're moving, but there's so much mass that they'll continue. And I think a lot of the uh, slopes in these craters are. We, we try to measure those. Basileski will talk about those too in, in a while. Is uh, uh, is, uh, is, is pretty low. So uh, we don't see much deflection, nor, nor do we on the, uh, on the lunar um, uh, boulder tracks as they cross, uh, as they cross craters. Um, so a question was due from uh, Ryan uh, Chandler, is, is uh, do the grooves appear to radiate from craters? Uh, they look parallel to him, and I, I think that's a very good observation. So what does that, uh, what does that tell us? Um. Well, I mean, we're, we're sort of conditioned to think about uh, impacts on, on large planets where the energy is at the center and all that energy flows out in a radial distribution. And, 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 and on Phobos, uh, the, the higher energy ejecta just leaves. And so we're talking about very low velocity ejecta that's modified by the gravitational circumstances of Phobos and Mars and the rotation of Phobos and, and some of the models, you, you may see them within a year or so. You'll, you, what, we, what we are seeing is that, that there's an initial radial distribution, but then that's quickly modified. That's quickly modified and drawn into linear directions. 
in, in several directions depending upon the initial launch. I think another point too is uh, uh, I, Anton, I believe it was, asked uh, what what is the what do the ends of the grooves look like? And uh, certainly, if you take a look in some of the maps uh, that we've done in some of the examples uh, in the Basilesk, I'm sorry, in the Wilson and Head paper, uh, in the terminations of the groove, sometimes they narrow, and uh, this 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 together with the lack of boulders at the end uh, led us to interpret that uh, they actually after rolling for many kilometers could actually get into a low gravity area on the surface of, of Phobos and actually go into suborbit, uh, leave, leave the surface, uh, only to perhaps impact again at, uh, you know, somewhere around the, the surface. So I, I don't know, is that, does that seem feasible to you, Ken? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a, I mean, I've, I've said this enough, enough times I can get away with it, that Phobos is sort of the Las Vegas of, of the Martian system and things that leave Phobos return to Phobos, and so any block, any boulder that rolls to the end and rolls off into space uh, will wind up back on Phobos, and and so you know that's why I put in that slide what happens to the boulders, and when you consider the storm, I use the word storm, but the spike of, of secondary impacts that are returning uh, to Phobos, uh, that that suggests that larger blocks might be broken up into smaller blocks. I mean, the answer is that they have to be on Phobos; they can't be really anywhere. Two related question, uh, one from Wesley Chambers and one from uh, Stephanie Gibson. So Stephanie asks, if you assumed all craters inside Stickney are secondaries and, and didn't include them in the count, what age is Stickney? And Wesley asks, how does the cumulative effect of Stickney uh, eject affect pre-Stickney cratering record? I think those are kind of related. So. Yeah, well, well, Nico very clearly uh, worked out the age of Stickney if you assume that the craters that you see in Stickney are indeed background impacts. Um, I don't have that right in front of me, but it was, you know, in the neighborhood of three billion years, something like that, depending upon how you look at the model. And you know, um, that's you do crater counting, and that's what it tells you. Um, in terms of uh, craters prior to the Stickney impact, um, I suspect that the the seismic shaking of the Stickney impact probably uh, muted just about everything that's there, and the underlying. Um, craters other than st secondary impacts from Stickney are going to be large and muted, and that's pretty much what we see. So, Anton, uh, Anton asks, are the two ends of the groove morphologically different? Um, they, they, t they, well, I, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it can generalize, but generally, uh, the grooves, um, start out fairly thin and, and broaden, and then they end by thinning down. So they're morphologically somewhat similar, but, but I don't know, Jim, Jim may have a better uh, well, I, way of describing that. Well, I think, I think they tend to be broader at, at the Stickney end. Well, that, I would agree place, with that. Yeah. And then, and then narrow, narrow down, uh, at least there are certainly some of them that do that. Yeah. So um, let's, let's move back to the question um, of uh, uh, that we started at at the beginning about the desynchronization. So uh, several people ask, uh, what would the effects of the properties of Phobos and the impact have on the, the basic process as you describe it? So for example, uh, what about oblique impact? What effect would that have? And then secondly, if it was a rubble pile, how would that affect the energy partitioning um, compared to, uh, to rock, say? Okay. Um, well, I, th I thought about oblique impacts, but basically you end up with a crater. So there's a certain amount of energy that's required to produce that crater. If it were an oblique impact, then you need a bigger impactor. So ultimately, it's the same amount of energy is required to produce a nine kilometer diameter crater on Phobos, whether it's oblique or direct. Uh, oblique impact might uh, help uh, in, in produce additional uh, rotation, although probably not because uh, the, the, the rotational energy uh, um, is mostly directed straight in, in, right into the target body, even on an oblique impact. Um, let's see, what was the other half of that question? <laughs> so how, would, how would a rubble pile affect rubble energy pile. Oh, partitioning? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, part, part of the uh, process of converting energy uh, is, is, is compression. So if you have a rubble pile, there would be more compression, but that energy still ends up in Phobos. So, okay, so it, it, the, the possibility is that perhaps uh, it, more material gets pressed deeper into Phobos as a consequence and you get a stronger twirling ice skater effect. 
But generally, it, it, you know, the amount of energy is defined by the velocity of the impactor and the mass of the impactor. And, and, and okay, there might be slight, or there may be even substantial inefficiencies that are introduced by a rubble pile. But we have so much overhead in the model, uh, probably a, a desynchronization time of, of 5,000 to 20,000 years is so much more than the 1,000 years that we need that even if, you know, we lose half of that, our energy to that, it's still not a problem in the model. Okay, so from um, Emerson uh, uh, de la May, how do you uh, determine, how did you determine the efficiency uh, when treating Stickney as a rocket? Rock efficiency, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it's, um, I mean, the rocket equation uh, starts with the, the mass of the rocket, you add the fuel, the mass of the fuel, and then you work out what's the velocity of that propellant as it, as it exits. That, that's how the equation works. Um, a perfectly efficient uh, engine uh, it, it ejects all of that, that, that fuel in a straight line. So a large portion of the inefficiency is because the flow of ejecta from Stickney goes out in a cone shape. So we lose about 30% of our energy because of that, and that's most of the inefficiencies. The other uh, is from the literature. Um, it's it's I hate to say this, but it's in the paper that, that lists the details about where the um, energy is being lost. But energy is lost to melting rocks. It's, it's displacing material that uh, is, is not in directly in, in, the, in the direction of Phobos. Um, so yeah, it's not a rocket. It's not a rocket, and, and, I, and I knew that. But, but ultimately, you can work out how much, where does the energy go? I mean, you, you, it has to go to heat. It has to go to some sort of displacement that is tan tangent to the surface. Um, and it's in the literature that, that you, can, you can work that out. A okay, related uh, question to some of the ones we just previously talked about is uh, from Richard uh, Jarosek is, uh, how, how accurate is your uh, determination of the uh, orientation angle of sticking crater itself and uh, and thus uh, the impact direction could you derive okay. the impact direction for um, I okay. well it, it, it appears it appears that Stickney impacted a west for westward west leaning uh, slope that was pre-existing um, I, it, it's possible that the Stickney impact enhanced that to some extent. Uh, I, you know, I measured 13.4 uh, degrees. You know, it could be 13, it could be 14, something like that. Um, the difference in that angle, it, it would have to be substantial. It would have to be, you know, three. I'd have to be off by several degrees before the calculations are going to be substantially different. Um, it, it's a good question. Uh, off the top of your head, you know, did did was the, the impact in such a way that it produced the angle? Well, but in effect, whether it produced it or it landed on a slope, uh, the the cone of, of of the crater is misaligned to the center of gravity by 13 or 14 degrees, and the effect of the ejecta that leaves that cone is going to be what we've calculated. A related question is uh, from Wesley Chambers: Is how sensitive is the despin is the despin time to impact parameters like angle and mass? The despin time. Yeah. Um, the de the despin parameter uh, the the sensitivity um, is is it's related to the uh, rotation rate. You know how how compared to the orbital period, how, how fast is is the uh, satellite uh, rotating? Uh, it's sensitive to that, that initial condition. Um, it's, it's sensitive, very sensitive to uh, the, the distance of the, the satellite to Mars. Uh, because the, the, if you look at the, the formula, uh, the, the formula includes a, uh, an exponent of power of 6 on, on the semi-major axis. So if you're half, is half the distance to Mars when you're desynchronizing, the effect is much stronger. Th those are very strong. Um, the, the interior properties of, of the material to, of material properties of, of the satellite to dissipate uh, energy. Um, th there are there are estimates on that, but they're they're bounded by limits on, on our understanding of the interior properties. If it's a rubble rubble pile versus a solid competent rock, it, it's the differences are you know a factor of two something like that. So we take all of that into account. Uh, we we. we we take into account that, that 
Uh, we know the semi-major axis, we know the rotation rate, and we're less certain about the interior properties of Phobos, but it's not substantially different than, than what we would expect. So Wes Chambers asks, uh, assuming orientation swap, okay, um, does the discrepancy in crater density leading and trailing mm. uh, provide an additional method to constrain the date of, of the impact? Um, Probably. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I did a lot of hand-waving when I was looking at this because there is a substantial difference between the um, size frequency distribution on the leading versus the trailing apices. And you can imagine if, if, that, if that change happened in the distant past, that so there would be some opportunity to rework it back to some sort of, you know, preferential direction. And, and, and because it's so completely, so different, um, it does suggest that it's recent. I, I, I think it would take a lot more work uh, to, to try to pin down a date based on that. But in general, it appears that it's more recent in geologic time than in the distant past that, that this reorientation took place. And that's, you know, I hate to say it, but it's consistent with our model. <laughs> okay, Stephanie uh, Gibson asks, how to distinguish between primary uh, and secondary impacts like LIMTOC, for example. Are, okay. Is it possible to do that readily? Are there basic criteria or is it tough to do once they've left the planet? Um, the, uh, well, LIMTOC was, is, is, a, is a, it's an interesting situation. LIMTOC is a, is a, a 1.8 kilometer diameter crater inside Stickney Crater. Uh, yeah, we, we have a model here and I have model here and neither one of them are really clear but but anyhow it, it's it's if you consider the size of secondary impacts from primaries usually you don't see a secondary impact that's that big but on the other hand on planets we don't see most of the secondary impacts at all most of them are so far afield from the the primary that we really don't know what the complete size frequency distribution of secondary impacts is so it's possible that LIMTAC is a secondary impact if you assume perhaps that uh, Phobos is a bit of a rubble pile and a, an unusually large block uh, was ejected out of the crater. And as Nico said last week, which I found interesting, is that the age of Limtok is apparently the same as the age of Stickney. So that would be consistent uh, as a secondary impact. Uh, I don't have a problem either way as, as a primary a second or a secondary. Uh, it's very possible. I mean, there's clearly, since the Stickney impact, we've had um, background impacts on Phobos. So a question is, uh, if you assumed all the, from uh, uh, Stephanie Gibson, if you assumed all the craters inside Stickney are secondaries and didn't include them, can you can you get an age of Stickney from that? Uh, no, it's, I mean, it, it basically, we don't know what to exclude. I mean, it, we're, we're seeing that either <laughs> Almost every crater inside there is, is secondary impacts, or most, depending upon if it's a trailing or a leading hemisphere initial impact uh, for, the, for the Stickney crater. Um, so it's really, there's really no way to take them out uh, to, to work out an age using background uh, impacts. I, I, I think as a general rule on Phobos, you cannot use craters less than you know, one kilometer in diameter for age, uh, age dating. Certainly the really big craters on Phobos, you know, four and five kilometer diameter, though those are background impacts. But the small ones, there's so much returning secondary impacts on Phobos that it's, it's, it, it's obliterated the background record at those scales. And Stephanie Eckert asked, would the LIMTOC objective behave in the same way? I, I think she's driving at whether it might be expected to produce some grooves as well. Or if it's a secondary, does that change things? Um, the, the answer is that every, everything that hits Phobos, uh, or Deimos for that matter, is going to behave in the same way. The, reject, the ejecta will return to the same place uh, in orbit uh, that the original impact took place. Uh, lower velocity ejecta will potentially roll out onto the surface of Phobos. The higher velocity ejecta will return later as secondary impacts. It just will be a miniature version of the, of the Stickney impact, if it's a primary. If it's a secondary impact, it might be a little bit lower energy and the di distribution of ejecta might be slightly different. But overall, yeah, the answer to your question, yeah, it'd be basically the same process, but just in a miniaturized form. And do we have any clue what uh, type of meteorite uh, UCF 445 asks if we have any idea what kind of ordinary chondrite or whatever might have been the projectile? No, you know, you have a crater. Uh, 
uh, it, it, if in one you know in 18 years, according to the plan, we send astronauts to Phobos and we collect samples. Uh, we are it's very likely if you do a core sample, you'll pick up pieces of the original impactor. Uh, likely, it's it's an asteroid. I mean, that that's that's the most likely uh, um, source, but you really don't know. We have the size, um, and from that we can. I, I just assumed a, an asteroid. So, uh, Angela Kane asked if could, could the density of the ejecta, if it's not homogeneously in place, like different places, it's it's uh, preferentially getting ejecta. Uh, can um, can topography be used to, you know, detect where it's being accumulated in one area and not in another, for example, or is the surface just too irregular to even get at that? Um, okay. Well, the, the the distribution of ejecta that comes back to Phobos is fairly evenly distributed. Phobos is gradually ro you know, rotating, independent of its tidal lock. On each incident, it comes back, and then it's oriented in a different incident, and so over a million intersections, it's evenly distributed across the surface. And then if you add to that the, the ejecta that's, that's, eject, that's blown off the surface by secondary impacts that follows the same rules and comes back over a period of time, um, it's very uniformly uh, distributed over the, over the surface of Phobos. Uh, it, it, every surface of Phobos is going to be exposed fairly uniformly. Uh, I, I'm still thinking about the poles, but even the poles are fairly uniformly exposed. So um, James Keane asked, uh, 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 on the basis of the changing moments of inertia due to the Stickney impact, uh, does this change the orientation of the principal axes? And if so, uh, then uh, uh, the former leading trailing uh, hemispheres may uh, not represent the, you know, maybe maybe yeah, 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 different yeah. latitudes and longitudes. Yeah, right? I, I get it. I, I, yeah, the, the, when you make PowerPoint slides, you, you sort of round off things a little bit and leave out some detail because you need to finish in an hour. But yeah, I, I, did, um, I did look at that in detail because, because yeah, you, you're changing the three principal axes, you, you, for sure. I mean, certainly you're changing the A axis. And, uh, the, you know, work through it, it may be a few degrees, maybe a few degrees of difference. Uh, it's not enough to, to change it 45 degrees or 30 degrees. But yeah, you remove um, material, I mean, the principal axis uh, passes through Phobos about 45 degrees to the east of Stickney Crater, and you remove Stickney Crater. Okay, that will change things a little bit, but according to uh, you know, it's back. It's back of the envelope calculations. It probably uh, reorient when it, when it did reorient it. It was probably just a few degrees off of the principal axis, the original principal axes. Okay, um, Anton Ermakov has a, a a question, and the question is. So if you assume Phobos is homogeneous, uh, would the principal axes uh, be still close to the observed principal axes? In other words, is there any evidence of non-homogeneity of Phobos based on its shape and its observed orientation? Um, there's been a number of spacecraft missions that have flown past Phobos and tried to um, work out the moment of inertia of Phobos. Um, you know, it turns out that, that Phobos is fairly uniformly dense uh, from the surface down to the center. Uh, you know, we could do a little, we could conduct some more experiments and get that a little bit closer, but it's fair to assume that it's uniformly dense. Okay, Anton, just a quick note. Can you type in when you're going to get to Moscow? We're leaving tonight. Sorry to barge in here, but it would be great to know. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so uh, that pretty much, I think, covers the majority of the questions. I hope all of them. Um, I hope I didn't, in, in, in moderating here, miss any, and uh, is, first I want to thank Ken for a really an excellent presentation, uh, very well illustrated, and uh, I like your sidebars a lot. Uh, that really helped a lot to uh, address questions as we went along. Uh, I also want to thank um, uh, our colleagues at MIT and here at Brown um, uh, from SEED and also at class at UCF for, for all their efforts as well, and, and Survey Central, as usual, providing a very major um, uh, effort in sponsoring everything, Von Pendleton, the uh, director, and of course Ricky Guest and all the um, help that we get technically to make this happen, which is not trivial. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we thank you all very, very much. So next week um, we'll have uh, John Murray talk about the nature and origin of grooves on Phobos.
uh, and uh, and uh, Dan Britt will be the moderator for that. So I want to thank you uh, for uh, joining us. And if you have any additional questions, outstanding questions, please uh, email Ken uh, and or myself, and we'll we'll try to get back to you on that. So thanks very much. Great questions and and uh, great discussion. So uh, we'll we'll adjourn.